We took public comment at Tuesday night's meeting and will therefore not take any additional public comment tonight. Greg, please call the roll. Beck. Here. Schmidt. Here. Wilkin. Here. Singleton. Here. Camperth. Here. Hendricks. Here. Miller. Here. Coulterman. Here. All members present. All right, the item this evening is an ordinance to require individuals to wear facial coverings in public places in response to COVID-19 and exceptions thereof. Uh, first, I wanna explain procedurally where we're at regarding the proposed um, facial covering requirement. There was some confusion following Tuesday night's meeting as to what the vote meant. For an ordinance, uh, state law requires three readings which would require three meetings, but state law also allows the waiver of that requirement. The council often waives the statutory requirement with six yes votes, so it can vote on the ordinance at that meeting and not have to do the second and third readings. That is the vote that failed Tuesday night. There was never a vote taken on the actual ordinance itself. So tonight I will read the ordinance title for the second time and then the council will be asked whether it wants to waive the third reading. If it does so, and there are six yes votes, then we will proceed to a vote on the ordinance itself tonight. If the council chooses not to waive the third reading, then there will be another special meeting tomorrow night so that a decision can be made one way or the other. We have had more than 100 participants on Tuesday night's Zoom meeting and have received more than 160 emails on this topic. Since Tuesday night's meeting, some council members have suggested changes to the ordinance that was proposed. The council has before it the original proposed ordinance and an amended version containing council member changes for its consideration. One main substantive change was to reduce the fine to a fixed $100 rather than leaving it to a judge's discretion and amount up to $500. So now at this time, I will read the ordinance for a second time. No idea. An ordinance to add Article 2, Section 52.1.1 through 52.1.11 entitled Reduction in Spread of the Novel Coronavirus COVID-19 to Chapter 51 of the Sewer Municipal Code to provide legislative findings and intent to require individual individuals to wear facial coverings and exceptions thereof to provide for the enforcement of violations and penalties to establish a sunset provision to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form and to provide for a time when this ordinance shall take effect. The ordinance has been read by title a second time and is designated as ordinance number 2020-33 and the title is hereby approved at this time I would need a motion to dispense with the statutory rule I'll make that motion I have a motion by Coulterman is there second. a second? second second by Beck so unless there's any discussion Please call the roll. Mayor, can I ask a question? Yes. Just for my clarification and understanding. Sure. So this ruling right now, if we say we don't need a third ruling and we vote yes to move on, we pa like we vote to go ahead for the mask mandate right after this, correct? Uh, yeah, so basically this right now is just whether you want to require the third reading, which would be tomorrow night. If the council has six votes to waive that requirement, then we would go into the discussion um, regarding the actual ordinance itself, and there'd be opportunity as well to amend that if that was the council's desire. Um, so that would be the second step. But if the council chooses not to uh, waive that tonight, then then at that point we can end the meeting and come back tomorrow night <laughs> unless there was any reason for discussion. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. 
So unless there's any other questions or comments from the council, seeing none, uh, please call the roll. Beck. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Oh, I have to unmute him. <clears throat> there we go. Councilman Singleton. Yes. Hamprith. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Miller. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Motion passes. So at this time, I would, I will restate that this is ordinance number 2020-33. And ask if anyone would like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted, there will still be opportunity for discussion after this pro procedure. We'll still approve. Second. So we have a motion and a second. So now at this time, is there any further discussion? Mayor, let me, for the record, let me get the clarification. I know I have Beck for the motion. Who is my second? There were like three of us, just whoever. <laughs> Councilman Coulterman, will you be the second? Sure, I'll be the second. And this one just clarifies the fact that we're still moving forward with voting. This has nothing to do than saying that we're not meeting tomorrow, correct? No. Um, we So at this point, the council has waived the third reading. And so um, we will continue now with discussion on the actual ordinance. It can be amended. Um, either the amended version or the original version can then be voted on tonight. Okay. Right. So with, what was the motion that we just made? Right. That's and this is why I'm upset that we did this so fast. This is what I wanted to avoid. We just had a motion on the one that we haven't made any amendments to. Right. And now you have an opportunity to discuss it, which includes making the amendments. Even though we have a motion and a second on the floor? Yes. yes. There's a motion and a second. Which version, a is, which version are we voting on? You, We're not right voting now, on any which version did we just move to, move to approve? No. So what we, all this did was allow for the discussion on the ordinance that was proposed. Now you can offer up amendments to change that. And then that is what will be voted on eventually. Right. So you have to procedurally, I believe you have to move something forward to, to open the discussion. So I made the motion or Ellen did to move forward the ordinance as was originally discussed and I seconded it. And then now we can get to the discussion on what is actually in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. the, Kelly, the do you want to clarify anything? Hold on. I'll yes, add a that's correct. Yeah, that, that, that's accurate. You can now have a discussion about the ordinance and somebody can move uh, to, uh, to approve the text edits or changes as per uh, the red line version that's been distributed by Greg. Well, and also a point of clarification is that if no one moved it, if we lacked the motion, if we requested the motion to move it and no one moved it, it would be dead and we would be done. Which is similar so to what the happened. The motion is only the fact that we're agreeing that we can now talk about it. Right. Yep. Okay. I like common sense wording here. This lawyer stuff is driving me crazy. <laughs> I don't understand it. It's too smart for me. <laughs> Got it. Okay, proceed. Okay. So, Kelly, what's the cleanest way uh, to just proceed with, say that, say that we, we want to just discuss the red line version, the one that was amended? Uh, would, would one of us, after our discussion, then say that we're, like, would, would someone have to withdraw their first motion and say, make a motion that we approve the the amended version, or how does that work? Greg, did you want to take that? I mean, you can you can just move to approve the amendments, yeah. and then move to adopt the ordinance as amended. Yep. So I did check, and we um, 
have the red line. I have it on my computer so we can share it on the screen, just like if we were down in the meeting room. And then we can walk our way through the red line so we can talk about it. I can do the screen share on it. Uh, I also have a Word version of it. So if you choose to make additional amendments, we can type those in and they can be seen in real time. And so if we want to move to that, if that's how we want to do it, at some point, Councilman Camperth, someone may want to move to amend the ordinance to the red line version. Okay. If, if the one you sent out, you know, later this afternoon, the clean one and the red line one is the way it currently stands, I don't have any other amendments myself. Okay. Other than well, what's been made that you sent out late this afternoon. I think Council Member Beck would like us to walk through the red line, but I will, we'll leave it in your hands. We're at your direction now. I have it available and I can put it up so we can talk about what changes were made. I think it would be a good idea to kind of take a bullet point look at the changes that were made. Um, okay. Just to get everybody familiar with, with what we're talking about. All right, I'm gonna do a screen share now. Hopefully this works for everyone. Um, this is the, can you see that? It's coming All up right. yet. <laughs> yeah, we can now, yeah. yeah. Got it. All right, what you have in front of you is a red line version that includes changes that were recommended by council members uh, after the first meeting. Um, nothing has changed in the first uh, ordained sections. Uh, it still amends section 72-1.12. It's under that authority is what we're using. We're gonna amend chapter 51, article two, and that's gonna add 52.11. It's been requested to have it read the reduction in the spread of Norvell coronavirus rather than prevention. So you see that striked out in the new language in front of it. This is all part of the legislative findings. This is traditional in most pieces of legislation like this to list out the reasoning or some of the reasonings, maybe not all, for why you're implementing a piece of legislation. And so there's changes there that note exposure to COVID-19 presents a potential risk of death or serious long-term, I'm gonna move you guys around because you're kind of blocking my screen. Move the other side. Long-term disability. The exposure is widespread and poses potential risk of harm, including death to people in the general population of the city of Seward. There is a particular subset of the population that is more vulnerable to the threat and is thus at an increased risk and the threat is from Norvell coronavirus infectious disease. Uh, C, we've struck out manner in which, so it reads now the increase of the spread of corona or COVID-19 cases in the city of Seward creates an unacceptable risk to the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the city of Seward. We have striked sub D, which you can see what it previously read there. We've also struck sub E, and you can see the language there. The new D, which used to be F, reads the wearing of face coverings by every individual while the indoors in public places in the city of Seward will likely reduce community transmissions of COVID-19, potentially resulting in fewer deaths, serious health complications, and aims to ease the strain of, on hospitals and other medical offices and facilities. The new sub E, the wearing of face coverings by every individual while indoors in public places in the city of Seward will aim to help keep businesses open and operating, encouraging economic growth and preventing prolonged economic harm. Finally, sub F, it is just and proper for the city of council to exercise its authority under the Seward Municipal Code and Nebraska statutes in furtherance of protecting the public health, safety and welfare. Again, this section, um, while operative, is basically listing your, some of your reasons for implementing the code change in the ordinance. So, not terribly substantive, but changes that were made. Next up are the definitions. The only change that was made to the definitions was the second sentence in the definition of face covering. And that read that medical grade mask and respirators are sufficient face coverings, but to preserve adequate supplies, their purchase and use is discouraged for those who do not work in a healthcare setting of and other occupations that require medical grade personal protective equipment. This was recommended by a council member to be removed um, because it, it, it speaks as recommendation language. It doesn't speak with the authority that we typically find in code. 
uh, as, you, as you see there, it actually has the word um, discourage. Well, we're not discouraging stuff. That, that's for another place in time, um, not for an enforced code that we're going to go out. And so uh, there is no intent by us if you are using PPE that's of a medical grade, even though you don't work in those fields, to uh, have you get in trouble for that. So that was recommended to be removed. The definition of premises that are open to the general public remain the same. Um, individual face coverings required. Uh, you'll see this throughout just to eliminate, there was kind of some confusion to eliminate the confusion. Uh, this does not, and it's listed in a specific exception below, does not cover educational institutions, which includes both public and parochial and the university. I think you'll see that we add the university specifically, not by name, but universities as well. So that is the change in 52-1.3. Uh, the exceptions uh, for face coverings will not be required if the individual is seeking federal, state, county, and city governmental services remains the same. Seated at a bar or restaurant to eat, drink, or while immediately consuming food or beverage. Engaging the occupation, preventing the wearing of a face covering. Obtaining a service or purchasing goods or services that require the temporary removal of a face covering. We match this one with the next one is asked to remove the face covering to verify an identity for lawful purposes. Both of those are, are for example, if you went to go buy alcohol and you had to show photo ID to prove your, your likeness. Uh, number six we have removed is providing a speech lecture or broadcast to an audience along six feet of distancing from the other individuals is maintained. Um, they felt that this one uh, didn't basically work with the rest of what we're asking people to do here. Um, that uh, if it is important to be in these places, even if you're not exactly six feet away, but you're in a public space that the public can come and you're giving a speech or a lecture or a broadcast, you need to follow the rules as well as anybody else we would hold accountable to that. So that was recommended for removal. And then the renumbering of the last one, uh, the exception that's the, probably one of the most important, cannot otherwise wear a face covering because of a medical condition, a mental health condition, or a disability that makes it unreasonable for the individual to wear a face covering. Nothing in this section shall prohibit the owner or person in charge of a premise that is open to the general public from requiring an individual to wear a face covering during any of the circumstances enumerated above or from implementing a more restrictive face covering policy. You'll see in the premises that are open to the public, uh, the portion that, that we edit out here is very similar to what we just reviewed. Again, we remove the including of educational institutions because that's always been an exception in the original legislation. These all read exactly the same as above. Again, we removed the is providing a speech lecture or broadcast to an audience so long as six feet of distancing from individuals maintained. Renumerating number seven to six and the same exception at the end as what I read previously. Notice of face covering requirements. Any individual or entity which maintains premises that are open to the general public must post one or more signs that are visible to all persons, including workers, workings, customers, and visitors, instructing them to wear face coverings as required by this article. Um, I think we need to amend that to workers, correct, Kelly? You might be shaking. That was amended at the last meeting. Okay. Um, and so again, just removing the, the notation to educational institutions. Then we get into the exceptions specific provisions this article shall not apply to. We have courts of law, public utilities, or federal, state, county, or city operations, medical providers, facilities, and then we've added, including chiropractic care. Uh, we had some concerns about from community members whether chiropractic care was included within medical providers or not. We felt it was, but we're asked to enumerate that specifically, so we have done so. Uh, also including pharmacies, and then congregate living centers or facilities, group homes and residential drug or mental health treatment facilities, shelters, airport travel, election offices, polling places on an election day, or to the residential dwelling units. Uh, many of those living centers and group homes, uh, those are similar to dwelling units, and so that's why they're included. Sub two uh, listed that children under the age of five was an exception, and then listed what, again, we consider to be recommendational language referring to children that were three and four that may be able to wear a face covering. Um, enforcing a code, we don't, we don't wanna have questions about is your three or four year old able to wear a face covering and should we be getting into that? So it was requested that it explicitly just state 
children under the age of five, matching language uh, about school age children in the DHM and kind of how we enforce uh, the current mass requirements within our school districts. Uh, all the other uh, exceptions for federal and state activities remain, individuals at their workplace wearing a face covering, uh, if it would be a hazard for their job is an exception. We don't want anybody to get injured or, or killed or otherwise because of wearing a face covering that may endanger them uh, while they're in their employ uh, as determined by regulators. Number five is individuals who are alone in their office. Uh, the last section of this referred to in such situations, the individual should still carry a face covering to be prepared for a person to person interaction and to be used when the individual is no longer alone. Um, if they're an individual place, they're likely in a place or an office where that's not accessible to the public. And so that was requested to be removed. Um, I think if you're in a non-public area and your business or business owner or operator or regulator uh, wants you to have a face covering on in those situations or have one available, they'll regulate that. I think that was the intent of, of that change. Um, Number six, individuals officiating religious services. And then we have those communicating with the deaf or hard of hearing, individuals who are engaged in activities such as swimming or showering, a uh, face covering is not gonna be very efficient. Individuals who are exercising in an indoor business, these are, again, these are all ones that weren't amended. One that was removed, number nine, individuals in an indoor premise that is generally open to the public while playing a musical instrument. The reason we removed this is Upon review, we think that that's only going to happen uh, in a school setting, likely at the university, the appropriate public schools, and so that's covered under the exception below. Uh, at that, otherwise, it's probably taking place at a private lesson where it's not an accessible to the public place. We don't anticipate we're going to have any public concerts uh, anytime soon at the the band shell. So we think this one was safe to remove, and we didn't want to cause confusion or step on toes when the schools we're already regulating this how they needed to. And then again, it also falls under number 12, which is the exception on schools. So to remove move the confusion, this was recommended to be removed. We continue to put public safety workers there engaged in public safety role. Uh, that remains in there. Participates in, ap in athletic competition or practice. Again, the reason for this one is to regulate uh, any of the private youth activities or athletic activities that are taking place outside of a school setting. That's going to be, for instance, the use of the cattle facility, uh, where that might be a city recreational programming. Everything else will fall under the, the uh, exemption for the schools. And if your practice team or whatever is utilizing the school, you need to follow the school's rules. They're going to regulate that under this, the 12, number 12 exception. So uh, we did add number 12 just to be, so it is understood this does not apply to Concordia as well. We put universities, so public and parochial schools and universities. So that's been added. We still declared a nuisance because that is the formula and portion of state law we're utilizing. Uh, applications shall be everyone within the, the corporate limits of the city sewered. It does not extend into the ETJ. Uh, the main substantive one that was also changed is we reduced the penalty from up to and not exceeding $500 to making it a static $100. Uh, twofold reason, obviously, to reduce that penalty. Some felt that 500 was excessive. Uh, our recommendation from administration was, is we would like to see it static. Uh, it makes it easier for the police department to issue, if they were to issue a citation, they issue a citation for a static amount. So if $100, you can go pay your $100 fine at, at where you pay your, your tickets and you're done. You don't have to go to court, have a judge uh, determine that you are guilty or plead guilty to a judge, and then the judge has to hear the facts and then determine if they wanna give you a $50 fine or a $100 fine or $250 fine or a $500 fine. This avoids clogging up. We don't anticipate, we don't wanna write a bunch of tickets at all, but we also don't want these tickets to just fill up the courthouse uh, unnecessarily. And so a static ticket allows you to just go pay your fine uh, and the related cost and be done. You don't need to appear in front of a judge or anything like that. Um, so that is, there was a discussion, so I'll note, 
Uh, if you read into that, it says the penalty for such violation shall be $100 for any one offense recoverable with costs and in default of said payment, the offender shall stand committed to the county jail until such fine and costs are paid. There was some question about that. Again, you're not gonna go to jail or be sentenced to jail strictly for violating this. That language that I just read to you is if you should not pay your fine, which is pretty much standard operating procedure for any penal fine in the state of Nebraska, if you're unable to pay your fine or refuse to pay your fine, then what they do is they send you to jail and you sit it out. So uh, that's standard operating procedure. And so uh, we'd like to keep that in because if people know that they don't have to pay the fine, they may not pay the fine. Uh, and so that's why that one was recommended to stay in. Again, not designed to uh, go to um, jail upon offense. Now I will say, just from my police department standpoint, that if you get involved in other activities in disputing one of these issues and you cause uh, a scene or something else, somebody's asking you to leave because you're not wearing a mask and an officer comes to speak with you and you still refuse to leave, in that situation, then you've trespassed or committed another crime. Uh, the penalties for that may involve uh, a trip to the county jail. So uh, again, specifically just for this one though, there is no specific jail time. They're not gonna haul you to jail only for a violation of this. So um, that is the red line version in a nutshell. This, again, no specific tie to the, the, I know people brought this up, there's no tie to the date. That was the date that me and Kelly threw in there uh, to just make sure it was after a city council <laughs> meeting so that you could reconsider it before it expired. Uh, I'm freely open for changing that date. I have no issues with changing it. So do with it as you feel necessary. That is the red line version, including the changes that were recommended by council members. Uh, I'll let those council members speak to those changes, uh, but I can answer any questions you may have at this point. And I will open up. I'm going to flip back over and stop sharing for the moment as we discuss. If there's something specific in the language you want me to look at or re-bring up in the share for everyone to see at home, please instruct me to do so. <clears throat> How soon would this take effect? Are we giving uh, some leeway or is it immediate? Currently, under the what you're doing right now, it would take effect tomorrow because we, uh, as you read in the bottom of there, the way we pass all ordinances is as soon as they're published in pamphlet form, they're effective. Pamphlet form means we have the mayor sign it. He'll do that tonight if it should pass. That's our normal operating procedure and then it would become effective in the morning when we place it in the book. That's the publishing in pamphlet form. Correct, Kelly? He's shaking his head yes, so. And so a thumbs up. My question is, do we need to give businesses some time to get a sign going? Do, do we have signs to give out? I know when, when you go to Lincoln, there is a sign on the window that is it says because of the, the city's ordinance, you're required to wear a mask. What about that? Yes, we could set a date uh, or time specific that it goes into effect. That's perfectly within the purview. Uh, we're not declaring it, we're not doing it as an emergency declaration. That would require another vote. But again, all of our standard ordinances, once you approve them, we publish them in pamphlet form the next morning. That's something that just takes place within the office. It's a technicality. So they become effective essentially the next morning. Um, we easily can amend it to give you a very specific date and time. That can be done. I think one, the one more amendment I'd like to see is a hundred still seems high to me, and it might just be me, but I know a zero is not an option. Um, so I've seen ranges twenty-five to fifty. I'd like to see it go to fifty. Um, if we're still looking for something that's impactful, I know I wouldn't want to pay it, uh, but I know I'd, 100, 100 seems high. I'm with Carl on that as well. And I did some research and York is 25. So my question is, why didn't we do our comparabilities and go to other cities our same size like we always do and do that comparability to see what they're all doing. 
because like I said, York is 25. Did we just have a dartboard up there and this is the number we used or how did we come up with $100? Because I agree it's too high. Uh, I'll answer that. The okay. reason it started out with what it started out for is, as Kelly explained on Tuesday, is that is the general penalty in our, or in our codes right now and has always been for years and years and years. If you don't set a penalty, it's $500. That's what's referred to as the general penalty. And so we didn't want to assume for you what you did or didn't want. And so the default is always the general penalty. From there, one of the council members that sent in their recommended edits recommended the $100. So that's what's in the red line version now. All I can say is from an administrative standpoint, we don't want it to be so low that people think it's fun to just go out and cause disobedience and then pay the fine because they think it's fun to take up time. There should be enough penalties, we would hope that you'll think twice before you do it again, so that we're not just cramming our, this is from the administrative standpoint, cramming our officers with just ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket after police report after police report after police report that people think is fun to do because they're willing to pay the $20 fine or $25 fine or whatever it may be. Now, I will add, uh, there's also court costs. So every ticket you get, you're going to pay court costs as well. If you've yeah, ever gotten a ticket I, before. I still agree that, you know, $25, especially in times that we're at right now, that there are some people that $25 is going to hurt them because they don't have the money right now. You know, there's people still on unemployment. And like I said, I think $25 it's something, you know, that we're saying, hey, you need to do this. Uh, you know, I just don't want to put a hurt or a burden. If I could add, if they wear the if mask, could, if, if they're not going to be getting a fine. If I could also add something, um, you know, it's always been the recommendation of the state attorney general when it comes to enforcing um, these matters that education should be the first option. And so, you know, the, the first option is going to be for law enforcement isn't to, to write the ticket. It's going to be reminding people and educating people. The, the ticket and the fine is there that if people choose to ignore that, um, there needs to be something that will, you know, cause them to think twice about simply not ignore, simply not, um, you know, abiding by this and, and just paying a fine. Um, and so, I just keep that in mind that um, even with the original $500, judges don't typically fine people $500 for these types of violations either. The reason it was moved to 100 was just because I think the $500 amount scared some people into thinking that's what the fine would be, but it's in practice not. And in this case, the practice is going to be focused on education first and foremost. But if someone is going to you know, ignore that and not want to comply with that, then there needs to be something in place um, to more or less, you know, get their attention. But, but as a council, can't we make the determination what we want to charge? Yeah, yes. you can set the fine at whatever you want, but my yeah. point is, is that if you make it so small, people who, who are choosing not to follow this will just pay you $20 every time and ignore it um, and just play the odds that, you know, this may cost me hundred dollars, but you know what? I don't have to wear the mask. You don't want people to be able to buy their way out of an, out of following um, an, an ordinance like this. The other thing I will add, and again, I'm just not familiar with them around here because I don't prosecute cases anymore, is that there also be court costs with a uh, with a ticket like this, and so that will increase it. So I think it's reasonable. It potentially may be upwards of forty plus dollars for court costs, um, and so at the end of the day, I think our biggest one is by having that static amount, even if it was twenty five fifty dollars, it allows the officers to write the ticket and allows the citizen that is uh, in violation to rather than just go to court and have to take a day off of work and everything else uh, to waste you know if even if they plan to 
you know, plead guilty, uh, this allows them a way out of doing that. They can pay the fine and they can move on. Um, if you don't put it in there as a static fine, all of them are going to court. All of them are appearing in front of the judge. Um, and this also doesn't take away their opportunity to appear in front of the judge anyways. I mean, if they think they're not guilty, they can still go to court and, and have a trial and do all of that. That's not, you know, we're not circumventing the criminal justice process here. It's just giving an out to a citizen so they don't have to go to court and sit there and wait through the process and come in front of the judge and have it explained to the judge what happened. This gives them an opportunity to go, okay, I'm writing my check and depositing it off uh, to the court and I'm not going into court. No, so I agree with the static, the but. 25 but is a little bit I, low, I agree with the, Yeah, I, I agree with Alan too, but if we're paying $25 and you put 40 on top of that, you I mean, you're way, old, you're getting closer to your $100 right there anyway. Wear the mask. <laughs> Yeah, John, I was the one that I think originally suggested the hundred dollars down from the five hundred. And I thought I took those things into consideration too. And kind of like what Greg's saying is you you've got to make it it has to have some bite to it so that like with any ordinance, otherwise it's just like a parking ticket. And uh so and I did I did re have thoughts about that today. You know, maybe a hundred was too high, but I'm I'm still comfortable with that. I think it's reasonable. Or cost in county quarter, $49, FYI. Oh, then, what, then the other thing that concerns me, are the officers just gonna go around and patrol this more than they do traffic citations? I, I mean, I don't want a witch hunt on this, you know, that they're just gonna go out and try to get all the tickets they can for people not wearing a mask. Absolutely not. Uh, between me and the mayor, and the mayor oversees the police department. The, as he stated here before, uh, the intent of this would be to be educational first. We also are going to operate, as we did throughout the entire DHM, on a complaint basis. We have so many other things to do. We're so short-handed, partially because of this pandemic. We don't have time to just be trolling around looking for people not wearing masks inside of public places. What we're gonna do is provide education and if someone calls and complains, we're gonna follow up reasonably on a complaint. But we're not gonna be out on a witch hunt. Is that accurate, Mayor? Yes. I have a couple of questions. So in your face coverings, does a face shield meet those requirements and expectations no it has to be a piece of paper or a piece of cloth that's strapped around your face and your nose and your mouth that's eligible yes two what if a business owner has because it basically sounds like you know with all the exceptions how i read it and understand and clarify me if i'm wrong but it pretty much states that this is just for businesses like if you're going to be a public business that you have to have a face covering on there. So what if the business owner has a medical or mental or whatever condition that does not allow the business owner to wear a face covering? They, they don't have to wear it. How do they proceed with that? They don't have to wear do it. They have to be concerned and worried that somebody in the city of Seward is not going to patronize their business because them as a business owner that has a medical condition that isn't able to wear a mask is not wearing one are they do they have to be concerned that they're not going to be supported in our community well we can't control what our people in the community do that's no, a person. I'm just saying though is that is that acceptable though do they have to have a sign on their door that says that i'm a business owner that has a medical condition that i myself cannot wear a mask but you're still welcome to shop here even though i can't have one on no they don't have to they can but if they choose to they sure can. My yeah. hope is, and again, if hope was, you know, a million dollars, my hope is, is that people have empathy for each other. I think I've heard many people quote Councilmember Schmidt 
and our comments, his comments about how we need to be treating each other on both sides of however you fall on this issue. I hope people will go into this, however it turns out, and have empathy for other people and the situations they're in. Um, my officers, if they get to a complaint situation and somebody says, I have a medical condition, I can't wear one, that's gonna be the end of the line. Does that medical condition need to be proven by either a doctor's card, a doctor's note, a doctor's prescription, no, or anything, a don't. piece of paper? Anybody can just say that they have a medical condition and that has to be just understood. The mayor can correct me if I'm wrong in our line of thinking, but we don't have time to get into details and be requesting medical condition information or otherwise. We don't want to get into people's private medical condition information. If they say, I have a medical condition, and that is the reason I'm unable to wear a mask, that will be the end of it for my officers. Is that correct, Mayor? Yes, you're getting into HIPAA violations then, correct? We're not gonna discuss whether in, in HIPAA violations or not. The instructions from the mayor leading the police department is gonna be if somebody says they have a medical condition, they're unable to wear it, that's the end of the line of questioning, we're done. Right, and I think mine was just questioning in the fact if somebody does have a medical one, do they need to somewhat have a piece of paper or something that they have to provide themselves that, that was, nope. that's where it's going? Nope. Um, I would say my only last question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if there is any business that would happen to have any religious beliefs, does that get exemption or anything like that? I'll leave that to Kelly. Yeah, I don't, I don't think our sheriff's department is going to probably touch that either if they're going to raise that. You mean police department? Our police department, correct. We're not the county. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Um, I just want to chime in and say that I've, in my 14 years on the council, I've never seen an issue that has generated more public engagement and interest on both sides. I told one of my constituents this afternoon, I've also never had an issue that has had so much information available from so many respected people and institutions, and at the end of the day, after I read it all, I'm still as confused as when I started. And, you know, really for me, I think that uh, uh, what really impacted me was, was the other night was, was Dr. Kettner's uh, um, plea uh, for help. You know, and I think as, as an elected official, and I, and I did have some communication with him, as a policymaker, you know, we, we may have our own personal political beliefs. We, we all do. Uh, we have to weigh the constitutionality of it, the political aspect of it, but also the, uh, the, the concerns of our, of our institutions in our city, you know, our healthcare system, school system, you know, first responders. Um, all those things have to be taken into consideration. And I'm really uh, thankful, Greg and Kelly, for your work and responsiveness to the changes, at least some of the changes that I requested. Um, and I, I also spent a lot of time on emails and communication clarifying the vote, you know, which obviously was a little confusing the other night. Uh, that I that and I'm glad that the process worked the way it's supposed to. You know, we we were able to to uh, uh, review it and get some good changes. I personally think I'm not a lawyer, but it looks like a, a cleaner ordinance that I'm more comfortable with. At the end of this, there's going to be people that are upset, people that are happy. There's no way we can please everybody, but I think at the end of the day, it's it's really the responsible thing to do. I, I was just going to weigh in on the fine um, part of the conversation initially. Um, what if, you know, if, if we want to change it, I'm, I'm willing to, do, you know, I'm willing to consider that, but I personally don't want to go any lower than $50 um, because I think that's a, that's, I, I'm, I'm fine with a hundred, um, but that's just something that, 
you have to have some teeth in it. I feel like that's a, a good range. Um, the other thing I wanted to thank the community who's, who's on tonight um, for all that communication. I think, you know, we as council rely on your input and um, guidance and thoughts. Um, and, and while we may not agree you know, with every single person who contacted us, I really appreciated the tone and uh, the respectable, respectable way people were communicating. Um, I've seen a lot of constituent correspondence in my life and uh, it's not all so polite. And uh, Seward's true colors of community togetherness and, and support um, for our healthcare workers, especially really shown through in that communication. And so thank you um, to everyone who has been expressing that support to our healthcare community and for any of our healthcare um, team members and partners here on this call um, on this, uh, who are attending this meeting, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, it is really um, comforting to know that we have such amazing people looking out for everyone here and uh, that we have a place to go if we do need help or treatment. So thank you. And I think that I can say that on behalf of all the constituents who wrote in. Um, there's other council members that want to speak that I may have muted. Uh, please let me know. I sort of have a plan of how I want you, if you do plan to amend this in any way, proceed through that to address kind of all the issues you've discussed. So please let me know when you're ready to do that. Mayor, I would note we're currently sitting at 116 people joined us on this meeting tonight. I think at the time that you got started, we may have been near 80. And so there are still maybe some of those that have joined us tonight that caught it a little bit later as we were in the middle of the discussion or maybe reviewing the ordinance as redlined and offered. You might want to just give them a little reminder in regards to kind of the procedure, what's going on tonight, and specifically on, on how we're conducting this discussion and debate. Okay. One more time. Yeah, I'll just repeat what I said earlier um, when we began this discussion. Um, so procedurally, um, this is where we're at right now. So, and as I mentioned earlier, I think Sid also talked about, there was some confusion following Tuesday's, Tuesday's meeting as to what the vote meant. Uh, for an ordinance, state law requires three readings, which would require three meetings, but state law also allows the waiver of that requirement. Mm -hmm. Uh, the council often waives the statutory requirement with six yes votes so it can vote on the ordinance at that meeting and not have to do the second and third readings. Uh, that, that is the vote that failed Tuesday night. Uh, there was never a vote taken on the actual ordinance itself. So tonight um, I read the ordinance for the title for a second time and now we're having um, discussion. The, the council did vote with six yes, with the required six yes votes to waive the third reading. And so then we proceeded to discussing the ordinance uh, itself and the uh, proposed edits um, that are referred to as the red line version. Um, and so I think that's where we are right now. Um, Greg, was there anything else you wanted me to add? I just note that, I mean, we have all these people with us and so that they understand that the time for uh, the public discussion and the opportunity to, to hear from people uh, was on Tuesday night. And now it's in the hands of the council to uh, amend, decide, table, whatever, however we proceed on this. But um, Tuesday night was our, was our opportunity. And again, we did also hear um, the, uh, from hundreds almost uh, of constituents, both in favor and in opposition to uh, this ordinance throughout the week. I guess I would like other council members, because I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other about what I brought up earlier. Do we need to set this, uh, uh, you know, maybe Saturday instead of tomorrow, just to give businesses some time, make sure everybody knows about it, make sure they understand what, what it applies to and uh, what it doesn't apply to. Maybe just give them an extra 24 hours just before it takes effect. I don't have a good feel one way or the other. I'd be interested in what y'all want to think about it. 
Ellen, I was going to uh, state the same thing and agree with you. We, we kind of jumped into the fine after your comment and uh, let, let that hang in. And uh, a 24 hour period doesn't seem unreasonable to uh, give businesses a chance to uh, take the steps they need to take. Yeah, that I'm fine with that too. I agree. Yeah. But just so I'm understanding, are you saying that the ordinance itself won't go into effect for a certain period of time, or are you saying the ordinance goes into effect, but the requirement to put up signs doesn't go into effect until a certain time? I don't know. I I, I don't either have a way. specific either way. Just <laughs> give, give businesses another 24 hours before it goes into effect, so they can have it some chances to 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 take whatever actions they need to take. Plus, you would have your 24 hours to br brief all your police department members. I would, my recommendation would be 10 a.m. on Saturday. Just give it a definitive time. It doesn't go into effect at all. The, the signage or otherwise, nothing on the ordinance goes into effect till 10 a.m. Saturday at a minimum. I agree with that. That sounds fair. If we want to, if you want me to direct traffic so you can work your way through this, uh, and, and decipher on a vote and go how you wish. I just have an order I wanted to go in because I know it'll be clean in regards to how we handle this. So um, I can lay it out for you now if you wish. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah. yeah. I think what you should do first is make, an, someone should make an amendment or a motion to amend to the red line version. And we'll vote on that. Once we amend to the red line version, we can take up the fine itself after that's voted on and completed, and if you adopt the red line version, then we will make a motion to amend the fine. We'll vote on that. And then we can make an motion for the time that it shall take effect and vote on that. That will leave you, that's three motions. Once completed, you can make any other amendments you'd like. There's no limit on that. Once you've completed all the amending process, then there will be a final vote. And Greg, just to clarify, when you say the red line version, you're also including the edit to the Ward of Workers? In that working? is correct. Okay. Any questions? Oh. I was gonna move to move to the red line version. Okay. Motion by to amend to the red line by Schmidt. Seconded by Beck. Yes. Again, a reminder for those that joined us, the red line version, uh, we walked through it on the Zoom meeting with a screen share. Uh, the substantive changes were to the findings at the beginning. We specifically laid out that educational institutions, parochial, public, and universities are not included. And we eliminated some confusion there. We eliminated information and recommendations that talked about who could and couldn't wear a mask, maybe for three and four year olds. Uh, and other related matters. Um, but again, the most substantive one was making the penalty a flat $100 fee in the red line version. And so that was the version that was shared and walked through by myself uh, on the screen share. So, and there, is, and there was the typo for working to workers. Correct. Frank, can I ask one more clarification, please? Um, yes. Just because like, I got a, a question here that I forgot. Um, what what are we asking businesses to display? Are we providing them with wording? Are we providing them with signs? How are we working this? It's let's see, noted in the ordinance as it was originally drafted. Um, they must post one or more signs that are visible to all persons, including workers, customers, and visitors, instructing them to wear face coverings as required by this article. Um, they, again, they may want to provide their own because as, as we note, there are portions of these businesses that are not public areas, but if you have a vestibule, a sales floor, an entry area that the public can walk into, um, you may want to instruct that in this area, you're not wearing, you must wear a mask because this is open to the public. Non-public areas are not subject to this, but the public areas are. This is an area anybody from the public can randomly come into. That's what's gonna be the main problem. And so you need to sign that in, in those areas, you cannot, you must be wearing a face covering. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I think Ellen is asking. 
do we have specific language that will be available for businesses to put I, on a sign if they want to make either, you know, a sign? Yeah. I don't want to throw him under the bus. I'll see if he's on here. He is. I was going to suggest Jonathan might yep. want to chime in if he's here. I will coordinate with Kelly and Jonathan tomorrow and we'll put together and try to get, oh, there he is. There he is. He gave me a thumbs up. He knows what we're going to do. We'll provide a base level sign that if it is shown in a business, that will be sufficient if they have a public okay. area. Um, and so we'll put that together and put it out uh, both on our social media, post on our website. Uh, Jonathan will email it out and post it through their social media as well. And we'll get Kelly to sign off on it. So. Perfect. I think that um, and if you have that. anything else, if you have specific instructions or otherwise, you can always add more or have an additional <laughs> sign or recommendation uh, on your sales floor or whatnot for certain areas you want to identify. You can always do more. Thanks, Jonathan. Do we have a motion and a second on the red line version, including the word working edited to workers? Um, is there any other discussion? Call the roll. Yes. I'm going to. Councilmember Hendricks, I'm going to unmute you here in a second. Um, Beck. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Campreth. Yes. Hendricks? Yes, I agree to the red line. Miller? Yes. Holterman? Yes. Motion passes to amend the ordinance to the red line version. All right, I think the next one is to of the items that I know we want to deal with. Uh, that are in the queue. The next one would be any sort of motion to amend what is now the single hundred dollar fine to any other amount. And so you can make a motion and uh, a second and then we can discuss that and then see where we get from there. Um, I think that's the way to go, right Kelly? Shaking his head. There we go. I'm okay with Carl's request to go to 50 if that's Would you like to make that motion? Are we good on that number? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, I was going to make a motion to 25, knowing now that there's $49 in court costs associated as along with that as well. So I would make and, a motion I, to 25. And I'll second it. All right. We have a motion for $25 by Miller. And a second by Singleton. Is there any further discussion on that amount? See no other discussion. We call the roll. Beck. Is that a no? Just to make no. sure. Yeah. No. No. Bear with me because I'm also taking minutes. Schmidt. No. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Campreth. No. Hendricks. Oh, got to unmute her again. Hendricks. Yes, I agree to 25. Miller? Yes. Colterman? No. Oh, no, let's hold on a second. <clears throat> Kelly, I think you know a question I'm going to ask you. So I just want to make sure before we put him on the spot. That's a 4 4 tie, I believe. Is that, is that what you're? That is correct. Yep. So the mayor can cast a tie-breaking vote at this point? No. Motion fails. 
I move to amend it to uh, fifty dollars. I'll second. We have a motion by Beck, second by Coulterman, to amend the fine to $50. Can I ask a quick question on this fine? Sorry. Is the business owner also fined this amount for not doing it, or is it only just the patron that enters without a mask? Our goal is, and the mayor can speak to this again, as, as he is the, the lead and overarching person in part, charge of the police department. It's a very specific thing here in Seward. Um, our goal is to address the individuals that refuse to do it. That's gonna be the patrons and the people going into the public spaces. Obviously starting with education and just making the request, reminding them of the requirements of the city of Seward should this pass. The business owners, as long as they have this proper signage up and make a best effort to enforce it, we're not going to be penalizing or ticketing them. If they're essentially flaunting or in no way trying to enforce the ordinance, they're not posting signage, they're not requesting people put on um, masks or wear masks when they come into their public spaces within their enclosed business, then the business owners will be contacted, edu provided education about the ordinance. If they still refuse to do so, then the business owner would be ticketed. The focus is on the person that's refusing to do it. Thank you for that. But question. if somebody walks in that just doesn't want to wear a mask, that's not the business's fault. So we had a motion to amend it to 50, I believe, and there was a second. So is there any further discussion on that? Seeing none, please call the roll. Beck. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. No. Campreth. Yes. Hendricks. No. Miller. Um, unfortunately, 50 is better than 100, so yes. Alterman. Yes. Motion passes six to two. Okay, Greg, what's the next one? The next item would be to amend, uh, based on our prior discussions, I'll review the ordinance one time. Um, this is gonna be section four of the actual ordinance itself, which reads, this ordinance shall be published in pamphlet form and shall be in full force and effect from and after its passage, approval and publication or posting as required by law. Uh, we would amend that to a date, date and time certain uh, as may be a proposed by anyone that would offer an amendment. Um, it will fill in right after the word effective approximately. And we'll fill that in there for the final version and make that amendment before it is signed by the mayor should it, an amendment pass. I think Greg uh, threw out uh, 10 a.m. Saturday morning as far as the effective date, I'll uh, make that motion. Second. A motion by Schmidt, second by Beck, I believe. Yes. To become effective. I believe Saturday, December 5th at 10 a.m. I have it, Your Mayor. Yep, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Beck. Yes. Schmidt. 
Yes. I'm noting something here real quick. On a boat on the previous one. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Campreth. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Miller. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Motion passes. At this time, Mayor, uh, if there are any other items within the red line version uh, or the ordinance as amended, now the ordinance is amended. It exists only in its amended format. If there are any other items that the council would wish to amend, we could do so at this time. Uh, we can also continue discussion on the ordinance as amended. Any other questions or comments from the council? I'd like to make a motion to the um, Carl's oh Carl you skipped is that oh, correct sorry. everyone we didn't hear you we didn't hear a word after I would like oh. to make a motion well what oh my gosh it was such <laughs> golden opportunity you guys missed it all. <laughs> Um, no, my motion is to move the sunset date from the 20th to the 6th, um, which would be the following day of the first meeting of the new year in January. So we would still have the same availability to extend it if needed. The motion to amend the red line version and the sunset date to January 6th? Correct. I'll second that. I'll just check my calendar here. Okay, that is the Wednesday afterwards. That will... That is after, right after a city council meeting. Motion to Colonel, amend. what's your reasoning? Um, the reasoning for that is the same as the reasoning for the earlier one. If we do not have a need to extend it any further, um, we can have it sunset then. If we do have a further extension need, we can do it at that time as well. And Greg, if I understand right, before the sunset sunset date, if we feel there's not a need to have it in place anymore, we can rescind it, correct? You can rescind it any, I mean, we can call a special meeting and rescind it. Um, let's be technical here. If you don't do the sunset date, if you do any other date other than the sunset date, it's like amending a code, correct, Kelly? Correct. So that would involve passing a new ordinance to basically delete this code and then amending the um, suspending the rules so that it passed that night. Otherwise, you'd have to hear it three times to repeal it. If you let it die on the sunset, it just dies. If we can repeal it on any time. What's the point of moving the date? I, in the 20th, I don't think this is pandemic is going to get all that much better within the shorter period of time between now and January 6th. Um, I think we have a, you know, a, a chance to bend the curve a little bit, but you know, it's gonna take some time. Um, all of this doesn't happen overnight. It, it's some weeks on before we see actual results. So I, I don't know, I think I'm still comfortable with the 20th. We could come back if, if things get really well, like Greg said, we can come back at any time and, um, and um, just uh, say we're done. Right. And on the other hand, if we do need to extend it, we can extend it at that time. It's really just a question of how soon do you want to have this conversation again? Right. And while we contemplate that, I just want to confirm, Miller, you made the motion and Camperth, you made the second, correct? Right. Thank you. So Kelly, when we extend it, is it this complicated again or, or is it just a simple motion that we, we're going to extend the ordinance? No. Yeah, you would be preparing an, an amending ordinance. So we would jump through the same hoops again. You would suspend the statutory rule if you wanted to, uh, to amend the ordinance. Thank you. Any other questions or comments?
Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Beck? No. Schmidt? No. Wilkin? Yes. Singleton? Yeah. Campreth? Yes. Hendricks? Yes. Miller? Yes. Coulterman? No. Motion passes. We have now amended it to sunset on January 6th. Are there further discussion items or amendments anyone wants to offer? Discussion item that kind of bothers me a little bit and I don't, I don't have a solution, but if we're allowing for someone to just say, I have a medical exemption and not to prove it or have a proof, I mean, basically anyone who doesn't wear a mask will have a medical exemption. And I'm not sure what we, what we end up having. Well, Mayor, I think that's to you and me, uh, and maybe Kelly, in regards to how we're going to instruct the enforcement of this as the administration. As I said before, my hope is that that people that are not wearing masks, uh, that are doing so for medical reasons, that they have a legitimate medical reason they're doing so, and that we shouldn't be bothering people if they say so. Uh, if they're lying to us, I guess if you believe in karma, who knows? Um, I'd hope that if you're willing to not wear a mask and you don't have a medical condition, that you would stand up for whatever reason you're not wearing it then and say, I don't have one. And then see where the conversation goes from there. I think it does a disservice, uh, just like people that, in my opinion, lie about service animals. It does a disservice to those that need those service animals or the people that need to not wear a mask because they have real medical uh, health, mental health, medical concerns uh, to lie about it. But again, I don't know that I want my police force going out and questioning like medical professionals, people that claim they have a medical reason for not wearing a mask. Greg, Mayor? To protect the city, Greg, to protect the city, when we bring up the word medical, we're also gonna be bringing up the word HIPAA, aren't we? Or is that a Kelly question? That's, that's correct. You're raising potential HIPAA issues if you're going to start delving into the reasons behind the medical condition. That's accurate. Also, because we're enumerating within the code that if you have a medical condition, we don't enumerate in trespassing or, uh, you know, assault law or indecency law that if you have a a medical condition that uh, you somehow get out of it. Here we are saying that specifically. We're enumerating that very, very specifically. And so I think that uh, the level of investigation that an officer should have to put into it should be minimal at this point because we're listing the exception. Uh, if, if we come across somebody that we thought was trespassing or breaking into somebody's house and they said, I have a medical condition, that's why I'm breaking into this house, maybe we'll ask a few more questions. But in this case, um, my preference in, in instructing our officers is not to go any further in that line of questioning. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm just gonna say, you know, I honestly would hope, would hope we're not out there saying I have a medical condition, say it, saying it goes against my religious belief. Um, I, I think we are better than that as individuals and as a community. So those things are there for specific reasons. And uh, I think Greg pointed that out uh, very, very clearly. Greg, can I have you clarify this? This is just something that I thought about. There in the beginning of all of this was the difference between an essential and non-essential business. 
this pertains to the essential businesses that still cater to the public, like gas stations, grocery stores, and those kind of things, correct? Yes. Okay, how are we going to go ahead and identify a grocery store within a pharmacy or a pharmacy within a grocery store since a pharmacy is exempt from having mask mandate? Just so that Pack and Save continues to have customers that choose to shop within their stores if there's somebody else in the pharmacy area that doesn't have a mask on. I think that's going to be, we'll have to make an interpretation on that about who's shopping in there in regards to if they're going there and they're going in to do their business at the pharmacy and leaving then we're not going to be concerned about that if they're going there and saying hey i'm over here uh ordering my chicken and picking out my delicious meats and stopping up to pick some cereal up but i'm getting my pharmaceuticals well when you head over to get your pharmaceuticals you cannot wear a mask but if you're doing anything else in there uh, we're going to have some common sense i think i've We've probably said this a few times. It's about common sense. And the common sense says if you're in there going around running around buying your groceries, if your purpose in going in there is to just pick up your pharmaceuticals and get out, then we're not going to bother people. I just wanted to make sure that business didn't have to acquire the expense of having a partition wall or something of division up so that their patrons understood the difference between that. Nope. Any other questions or comments from the council? I move to uh, approve the uh, red line version as amended. I'll second. We have a motion by Schmidt. Seconded by Coulterman. And again, just to restate, uh, this is ordinance number 2020-33 as amended. And that just means that we're voting on the red underlines of everything that's been in detail, correct? Yes, this is, this is the final vote. This is, this to is the final it. vote whether or not we approve masks. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I think the discussion that I would like to make before we actually go to the vote is, um, and just to make clear, um, as we've all said, there's definitely been a fog of confusion, uh, especially since the initial meeting. Um, as far as I am concerned, I am empathetic to the hospital's needs. I'm not saying those do not exist. I am empathetic to the situation that we're in. Uh, COVID does exist. Masks can help reduce the spread. Uh, the way that this ordinance stands right now, I would be 100% behind up to the point of enforcement on individuals. So with that, I agree with what it's doing and how it's aimed to reduce the spread. And I think people should be doing this willingly. Um, but uh, since it's up to a mandate to force this upon citizens, I will be voting no. Any other discussion? Seeing none, then I'll say one last time. The question is, should ordinance number 2020-33 as amended be finally passed and adopted? Please call the roll. Beck. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. <clears throat> Campreth. Yes. Hendricks. No. Miller. No. Coulterman. Yes. The ordinance is passed six to two. Okay, I'll now need one final motion to make this ordinance a part of the permanent record. So moved. Second. 
Motion by Coulterman, second by Beck. Yes, there's a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Beck. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Campreth. Yes. Hendricks. No. Miller. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Motion passes. All right, that is the only item we have for this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Moved by Schmidt, second by Singleton. Please call the roll. Back. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Wilkin. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Campreth. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Miller. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.